Now it's our turn to, uh, sorry for the words, but put our balls on the table. Remember, kids, this is not how you play hockey. It's just ugly. I like it. Where are you guys? I'm doing this. You know what? I love ice cream, too. <laughs> Go back to Canada, Guy Lafleur. Game on! Yeah, game on! Hello! Welcome into the hockey show right here on Mile High Sports, Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show. JJ Jerez here. I'm the host. Hello. With me, my co-host, as always, very loyal, very dependable, Ryan Bolding of NHL.com. Ryan, how you doing? It's a playoff show. Hello. How exciting I'm is good. it? It feels like hockey weather out here, unfortunately. Ooh. I hate it. Thanks, I hate it. Meanwhile, it's 85 degrees in South Florida. In Seattle. It's not 85 I don't know what it is out there. It's supposed to rain the whole time, so it could be worse. <laughs> uh, but no, playoff hockey well underway. We're having some fun watching hockey. I mean, we've had some late nights this week, right? And what a good time it is to be in Denver. We'll get to that in a second. Of course, we have matinee money to worry about. We got a big show. Kinda, kinda. We got to talk about the whole show, though. We got, we got playoff hockey to dive into. We're going to have Jesse Montano of DNVR on Montano. the second segment. Montano. Sure. Not according to him. And not according to him, but if he if he if his name yeah. was actually pronounced that way, he'd have the tilde over the end, and he doesn't have that. Yeah, right. So Montano, what the heck, boy? Get with it, get with it, or get lost. Um, and then of course, uh, yeah. So he's going to be joining us from Seattle. We're going to dive a little bit into the Colorado Seattle series, and then we're going to look around the rest of the NHL. But first, we got to get to matinee money. No real matinee games today. Yeah. First, first NHL game starting at two p.m., which in my mind is an afternoon game, not so much matinee. So I didn't know really where to go. I, I know there's a four games today. It's tough to pick what is going to come out of which one. So I just went with what I thought the easiest, and that's the New York Rangers money line over the New Year, New Jersey Devils because I just don't see the Devils being able to hang with, with the Rangers, right? So that's a minus 155. It's, it's funny you say that because I said that, and we'll get into it later, about the Islanders last night. Hmm. When I was looking at bets, I was like, I don't know if they can do it. And they, boy, did they do it last night but i i feel the same way the rangers that's one series that just picking the series with no money on the line was hard to do mm -hmm. i felt like the rangers have the experience playoff experience they've got the vets they've got the goaltending they've got adam fox you know panarin zibanejad kane like this is a team that is pretty dangerous and we, we've seen the devils and seen the devils be dangerous but they don't have that experience necessarily they have game breakers Right. Coming into the playoffs, it was tough to make a decision. Now, in hindsight, you're like, why? Why? of course the Rangers are coming out on top, right? They have the experience, they have the weaponry, and they have the goaltending first and foremost, right? Which is now we're seeing New Jersey starting to question their goaltender. Never a good sign in the playoffs. Um, we've had five days of playoff hockey so far. In those five games, in those five days, day number one had one game cover the puck line. Or a team won by two. Day two had all four games, a team won by two. Day three, four, and five each had three of the four games win by two. So you know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. Puck lines, baby. I'm taking the Rangers on the puck line. Minus one and a half, plus 175. I love those odds. Not to mention the first two games that they played in New Jersey were both five to one finals. Five to one. That's all the, the Devils have been able to put together. And, of course, our condolences out to the poor souls out there who took the under on the Carolina-New York Islanders game. I'm sure going into that game, you're like, ah, these, are, these guys always hit the under. The under is a sure thing. You're watching the game. Oh, my under is a lock. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, three minutes to go in the game, the Islanders make it 2-1 and end the game 5-1. to one. Yeah, two empty my netters. under! The yeah. under was ruined. <laughs> I uh, I've been I've been betting on series, you know, multi-team parlays. I'll say right now I'm three for twenty, so it hasn't been great. But, but, I did hit Mitch Marner as the first goal scorer the other night. Ooh, at those plus have great odds. Nineteen hundred. Woo! So I am back. I am back to pretty much even from when I started. Uh, but, you know, my unnamed betting app gives me a little boost. It picks the game. Yeah, in the money. I'm rolling in it. Uh, it picks the game and gives you a plus 200 onto whatever pick you make. So 
So, you know, you, you look at a guy like Nathan McKinnon today plus 700. That's fine, you know, but I'm, I'm chasing that, that, that money. So first goal, first goal score is hard. I went with Kale McCarr tonight plus 1900. I mean, those are plus 1700 for Kale McCarr seems low. We know he's hurt, but seems low. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's always good player props out there, and especially when it comes around Kale McCarr. For instance, his over-under on points is .5. Yeah. Yeah, the odds aren't great at m- minus 190, but if Kale McCarr is in the game, chances are he's getting at least an assist, yeah. right, at some it's point. It's been a little slow going for him. I also took a three-pick parlay. Knights over Winnipeg. Winnipeg actually projected to win this game somehow, some way. Uh, I took the Devils over the Rangers, and I took the Avalanche over the Kraken. have to say, kind of leading in my next point here, the Rangers-Devil series is the only series 2-0. and Yep. The Seven only, of eight series the are only requiring sweep. a game five. That's still a lot. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, so I also hedged that bet by then doing a 14 parlay. Knights, Leaves, Rangers, Avalanche. It's a lot of action. It's a lot of action. Um, yeah, so along with the sweep still being alive, Ryan, this week has been such a unique here and unique week here in Denver, right? Because we've had two playoff teams going. Not only that, two playoff teams with home advantage. You see the Nuggets right uh, on the verge of making a sweep. You see the Avalanche. You know they're struggling their way through the first series, but I think they'll figure things out. It. I've a, I attended both this week. I was at both Avalanche games and I was at one of the Nuggets games. That's game two. I mean, I'm surprising. They don't charge you rent at Ball Arena. I literally spent all week at Ball Arena. My, my yeah, significant I know that other feeling. was exhausted. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is the vibe in the arenas is is just different than years past. We've had years before where both teams were in the playoffs. We've had years where one's in the playoff and not the other. And the excitement in round one is just there. It's 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 captivating. You feel it in the building. Now I don't really feel it as much. Now I feel like the bar has been raised, especially from Nuggets fans, right? Nuggets fans are the ones sitting here like, oh, man, we've been to the first round before. This stinks. This is boring. Not only that, the team they're playing isn't really putting up much of a fight. So I didn't get the whole playoff vibe in the ball, in ball arena for that game two for the Nuggets, much like I haven't gotten the playoff vibe from the Avalanche games. This might be a little bit more so from the team itself than it is from the fans, but I've yet to feel that playoff energy. Maybe we got little snippets of it in game two, just little tiny windows of playoff energy. But it feels like overall here in Denver, the playoff bar has been risen and nobody's satisfied. Nobody's elated. Nobody loves first round playoffs right now. Bar is risen. I don't know, Danny, do you get the vibe that there might be a, a Stanley Cup hangover in this city in terms of fandom and excitement. Maybe a little bit. And Danny's a Danny's a big basketball guy, so I know he's keeping a close eye on these Nuggets games. Would you agree with the sentiment that maybe that electricity that follows playoff, especially round one of playoffs, just doesn't seem to exist right now because the expectations are so much higher for both teams? Yeah, to a degree, and also I think part of what goes into it the Avs dealing with all the injuries they did all year long and then kind of coming into the playoffs on a little bit of a hot streak the Nuggets being healthy finally and going into the playoffs on a little bit of a down streak I think the contrast from how they finished the season to the playoffs when they were clicking makes it seem like the Nuggets have a little something going but you're right since Minnesota's not putting up much of a fight it doesn't feel like the playoffs yet Right, it hasn't hasn't had that energy yet. It hasn't. I, had- I will counter this this one thing that I felt in Game Two at Ball Arena, you know, inside the building, and maybe some of this has to do with the altitude situation. You know, you're not you're not getting that piped into you, right? But at, Wait, at, you're not getting the altitude piped into. I'm you? I'm not getting the the KSC Sports Property, you know, rah rah piped into my mm. head. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do feel like I was impressed by the crowd at game two, the avalanche. I think we can all agree we're playing terribly to start that game. Mm-hmm. Jared Bednar called it the worst period they've played in the series so far. He called it terrible. No surprise. It was almost shocking how bad it was. The crowd still cheered every time the Avs touched the puck. They were still in it. They were still engaged to a, to a degree where you were like, wow, like, 
I'll have what they're having. I don't know if they were liquored up or it was just the excitement of playoffs, but they stayed in it, you know, and I, I think that helps when the Avalanche start to turn things around, the crowd are in it. When they scored two goals, 48 seconds apart, I'm scrambling to keep track of what happened in the first goal. The crowd was so loud. I could hardly tell if the Avalanche had the puck or not the, for the duration of that. And then the Avs went down and scored again. You know, a quick one-two punch really caught Seattle on their heels. The crowd was in it, though, the entire time. And so that's a credit to them. I think just a relief, maybe. That was a, a, a cheer of relief, right? They were down 2 nothing in game two all year long. We're feeling like, oh, this just isn't their year. And now here we are in the playoffs. They're still proving this isn't their year. But then they come back. They show glimpses of the team of old. The comeback kids from last year, right? Or the cardiac kids, I think, was the was the name I saw thrown around a lot. And and they get themselves back in that game. Not only that, they go on to win the game. I mean, yeah, pumped some life in there. But I think for a second there was some, oh, man, we're here to be supportive fans because we love this team. But I don't know if this is their year. Well, and I'll say there were boos. The team was booed. It was off ugly. The ice after the first period. I actually had somebody tweet me last night and say, I was at the game. I didn't hear any boos at anybody other than the refs. And I'm like, well, did you show up at the second period? Because they were booing the avalanche in the first period. Yeah. And they deserved it. You know what I say to that guy that tweeted you? Boo! <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I guess we, we only have about 30 seconds left here, Ryan. But um, do the avalanche now have control of the series? Do you think momentum has swung their way and uh, everything's headed in the Avalanche's favor the rest of the way here? I do not think that. I do not think that this is a secure and safe series for the Avalanche at this point in time. I expect enormous things out of Seattle in their first home playoff game in franchise history. The building is going to be insane. They're going to be jacked up, and they know that they can beat this Avalanche team. I think that that element of doubt can do a lot. You know, we saw what happened to Philip Grubauer in the playoffs with the Avalanche a couple of years ago when mm-hmm. that doubt crept in, when he was suddenly human and not superhuman, you know, cracks in the armor, cracks yeah. in the wall. I mean, they were feeling high for a second there, right? They, they thought they were going back to Seattle with control of the series and in a 48 second span ruined everything about, about that and planted the seed of doubt in their minds. And here come the defending champions with speed and vigor. I think is what Seattle's thinking. But at the same time, they clearly know that they can skate with these guys, right? They've done it all regular season. They've done it for four out of the six periods so far this series. Um, So in my mind, they still have control. They still have all the confidence they need to beat the Avalanche. So let's get Jesse Montano's opinion um, on the other side of the break here and see how the vibe is. Vibe check. Vibe check from Seattle here with uh, Jesse of DMVR. So stick around through the break here on the Hockey Show J.J. Jerez, Ryan Boulding, we're having some fun today. Playoff style. Playoff, baby. Danny Bailey behind the guys. We'll be right back. Right now, it's 16 minutes past the big hour. Is that not right, Mr. Scream? (laughs) Great. Good stuff. I think people are getting really cranked. Welcome back. Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show. J.J. Jerez, Ryan Bolding. We're heading to the man advantage. Power play one. Got Jesse Montano on the phone from Seattle. I know morning skate's just getting underway, Jesse. So thank you for taking the time to hang out with us and give us some updates. I noticed, I saw I saw on Twitter, and I see we're back to normal. It's a day that ends in Y, so Cogliano is on the ice first. Does he jump back in the lineup with that? Look at the... Let me let me give you a two-parter here. Look at the okay. the, the line combination changes that that we saw from game two, and yeah. how I guess how it it seemed to have worked. Are you a little bit hesitant to throw in a whole nother mixture when it seems like they found the right recipe? I think if you're pulling a guy like, and with all due respect to Ben Myers, I think if you're pulling a guy like Ben Myers out of the lineup for a guy like Andrew Cogliano, even though you, to your point, JJ, had a good response, you won the game. I think that's a, a trade-off you're fine with making. Again, that's nothing against Ben Myers. I don't even think he was necessarily bad in the last game. Andrew Cogliano just brings just a completely different element to the game for them. Uh, just, you know, so hard to play against. And, and we know, you know, he kills penalties. He blocks shots. He does all the stuff that you need guys doing uh, in a playoff series, especially when you're playing against a team the way that Seattle is playing. And, and, and I think you just, uh, you know, I, I think you're fine with making that change, even though, to your point, went well for game two. If you're getting a guy like Cogs back, if he's available, which we won't find out here for sure, 
uh, until uh, probably about another 30 minutes we talk to Jared. If he's available, I think you plug him back in, uh, you know, over a guy like Ben Myers. We know Gabriel Landeskog's out for the playoffs. He's been out for the season. We don't know when he's coming back. He's on the trip, and he is on the ice for some reason yep. here in Seattle. What does that do to this team? Just having, I know we've had conversations about what he brings as a presence, but what do you see this doing for this Avalanche team, just having him out there? Real Reg Dunlap vibes there. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's interesting because through both of the first two games, I mean, like you guys know, you've, you've been in the room, they've talked a lot about the fact that, that Gabe is you know, very vocal right now during intermissions, uh, you know, talking to guys in the locker room, talking about what he sees. And I thought it was really interesting how Jared Bednar, uh, after game two, talked about it's nice to have a guy like that who's maybe not as emotionally invested in, in the game because he's not actually out there you know, competing, he's not on the bench. He kind of can have a little bit of a different perspective, maybe see things a little bit more clearly. Um, I, I think it makes a huge difference. And, and you know, him being out here on the ice, obviously, you know, he's not going to play. Um, but I think just seeing him out here brings a little bit more normalcy, and it just helps him stay more engaged with the team and more in tune with how they're feeling, what they're saying, what they're seeing. Uh, I was actually thinking about it walking over to the rink this morning. That was his shot that just hit the glass in front of me, if you guys heard it. I was thinking about it walking over. I said, wouldn't that end up just being this crazy storyline if the Avs are able to go on any kind of run, whether they you know win it again or just are able to go a couple rounds deep? I just think it's going to be a really interesting storyline that you know injured captain Gabe Landeskog so valuable to this team that purely just his presence, just him being in the locker room, you know, was maybe enough to to will this team through a couple rounds. Um, when he jumped out here this morning, I honestly I was kind of like half paying attention. I thought it was Miko. But then he, you know, he he took a shot, and I said that wasn't Miko's follow through. And I looked up and realized it was Gabe. So um, interesting to see him out here. Uh, you know, they they brought him on the trip, so might as well get some reps in, right? But uh, no, I think it's been huge. I think it's been huge having him around. And and you know, we all talked about them not having him in this playoff run isn't just a detriment on the ice, but it's it's what he brings off the ice. So him being around and, and him just acting as much as he can, like one of the guys, I think is um, I, I I don't think it's anything to turn your nose up at it's funny because last year in the playoffs we remember he didn't participate in a single morning skate maybe this year without participating in a single game he's at all the morning skates and he, i don't know what what's what do you think that vibe is like jared bednar you know because I, I, that stood out to me too the the point about he's less emotional he can bring a different message to the locker room i'm, I'm picturing suddenly jared bednar in the locker room being all emotional and riled up and maybe yelling at somebody <laughs> and gabe landis coming to play good cop and saying hey Calm down, Betsy. I got this. You guys need to calm down. So it, it's funny that this is all a storyline that's that's coming up because I don't think it's that weird, right? I think a captain hanging out in the locker room, yeah, he's going to do that. Playoffs, he wants to support his team. But we look a little bit deeper, and we know Gabe Landeskog has such a huge presence with this team and um, you know, almost transcends the team as a whole at times that it, it's suddenly a story. I, I had no question there. I just wanted to, to comment that. So... My question to you, Jesse, after you, I know you got there early yesterday morning. You had some chance to experience Seattle, the city, a little bit. I know here in downtown, you know, you walk Larimer Street, you got the Avalanche jerseys hanging up over the, over the road, you got Nuggets banners all over the city. What's that vibe like in Seattle? What's the energy? Is, is there a palpable playoff feel to the city right now? So, you know, not not a ton that I saw, to be honest. I, I have a, a great friend that lives here in Seattle, so I was able to spend some time with them yesterday, and, and we kind of did more of the, uh, like, outside the city stuff. So today was really kind of my first morning uh, walking through the, you know, the streets of Seattle here, and you can definitely feel it. There's a lot of, you know, I guess Seattle Kraken playoff signage. I don't know the best way to put that, but kind of like what you're talking about there, you know, around Larimer, a lot of banners, a lot of, you know, businesses that have, uh, you know, whether it be posters of, of players, you know, Matty Beneers, or just the logo, uh, the, the, the playoff slogan I've seen on quite a few places. So, you know, I definitely do think there's a, a bit of buzz. Uh, i got to get out of Arif's way here, uh, showing oh, nice, up a little late to morning skate. Nice of him to show up. Ask him when he's going to post my story <laughs> on the website. <laughs> I'll ask him. Uh, but, yeah, you know, so it, it, I don't, I don't want to, like, put the town of Seattle or, you know, city of Seattle on blast here. I haven't seen a ton. Uh, but again, I, I haven't done a ton of exploring. I'm definitely going to go walk around, find some food and stuff this afternoon. But, uh, you know, talking to some of the local media here, uh, old friend Ryan Clark, who now writes national stories for ESPN, like 
It's an expensive ticket to get in this building tonight. Seattle's a great sports town, and they understand the moment. They understand that this is the first playoff game, uh, you know, in NHL history play, being played, or I guess not in NHL history, but in, in Kraken history being played here uh, at the arena. There's definitely a buzz. Like, people are ready for this game to be going tonight. I'm expecting a pretty, uh, you know, bonkers atmosphere once the game gets going tonight. Um, but, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see, you know, to your question, J.J., just how much the city is embracing. So I remember that was something about Vegas that stood out so much to me that first year was just that the city was immediately just diehard, you know, for, for everything. And, and every, uh, every business had stuff in the, in the windows and bars, had all kinds of watch parties and all that stuff. So uh, I'm anxious to see what all, what all I see. Because right now I just see a bunch of, like I said, signs and posters and, it's what, great, but I, I know there's a ton of passionate fans out here. What is their what is their playoff slogan? Uh, the legend awakens. Mm. Still yeah, better than on, our way, the hard way, or whatever it is here. Our way or the highway? Wait, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's a cool logo. They got it on all the towels out here, and uh, so yeah. No, like I said, I'm 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 looking forward to the game presentation tonight. Definitely grab me one of those towels. I'm a playoff towel collector. I like to. Are you? I like to collect them a little bit. Uh, I'll see what I can do. Jesse, I'm kind of going back. I mean, so Jared Bednar yesterday basically said they'll be going optional skates from here on out. You know, whether it's an off day or a day on the ice. So we're not going to get like super good looks at everybody um, and their state. Uh, a lot of that is driven by Bednar himself with some input input from the players. But I, I'm curious, you know, how you've thought certain guys have handled the, the first two games. In particular, Darren Helm. I know we talked about Andrew Cagliano, what he brings. It seems like if Darren Helm can stay healthy, he just brings enough of a next level over a guy like Ben Myers that it, it makes a difference to this team. Totally. I, I mean, it was, it was funny because that first day, uh, I believe it was morning skate for game one, and we talked to Darren Helm. Uh, and, you know, he just kind of gave like this real like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get ready. I'm trying to push through this. Um, and so when he went in for game two, I actually had the thought, I was like, man, does he actually help you there? But then you see him play. And, and to your point, Ryan, it's just like his, his, it's just his presence and just him being there um, and, and his experience and just how, I don't know if I want to say used to having to ramp up at this time of year he is. But I think when you look at this abs roster and it's, clearly nowhere near as deep as it was last year you, you need guys like that uh you know you you need guys like darren helm who aren't going to be overwhelmed by the moment uh you know who, who are comfortable in these games when when the checking gets a little bit tight the pace picks up a little bit and that's part of the reason why going back to the very first question about andrew cogliano why i think plugging him back in on a night like tonight even if he's not quite at 100 percent, i think it makes sense and i think it's the right move uh because you need that experience. When you don't have as deep of a team as you did last year playing against a team that's got great depth, you need guys like that to be able to contribute in any way they can uh, in the bottom six. So we saw Darren Helm getting loose this morning. Uh, he's out here on the ice. I'm expecting him to go again tonight. Uh, I, I have a feeling that we're going to see a, a reuniting of the line last year, the fourth line last year that was so good for the Avs, of Cogliano, Helm, O'Connor. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that uh, Jared Bednar is, is going to – that's his safety blanket, right? He likes going to that line. He knows he can trust them. Uh, and I think he's anxious to get uh, all three of those guys back put together. I'm going to change gears here just a little. Just turn, the, turn the, the volume knob just a little bit here to what we saw in game one in the first period of game two. How concerning is that? In, in regards to the overall state of this team in this postseason. Like, that's – it's kind of uncharacteristic. I thought, in particular, the first period of Game 2 was uncharacteristically bad hockey. Look, uh, uh, you, you would never get these guys to admit this, and, and they would maybe even be offended at the notion of it, but you just won't convince me that through those first four periods of hockey, I think Seattle caught these guys off guard. I, I think that they were maybe expecting Seattle to, you know, have just – so much respect for them that they were going to kind of, hey, we're just happy to be here, you know, kind of roll over. Uh, you know, it's fun to be involved in some playoff games. And, and I think the Abs are maybe, you know, smelling themselves a little bit there. Uh, in game one, got smacked, you know, punched in the face. And, and, and again, I, I just think that maybe they were expecting, oh, well, we'll come out and we'll just, as long as we skate hard in the first few minutes, they'll kind of, 
they'll kind of just go away for us. And, and Seattle sent a message that they are not going away, and the Avs had to crank it up to, to, you know, be able to pull out a win there last night, or two nights ago, excuse me. I think those first two games were a bit of a wake-up call for them. I, I, I'm expecting – a much better game tonight. You know, I, I haven't had necessarily a huge issue with the effort for the Avs. I think they've skated hard, but through those first four periods, it was just it was just bad hockey. Like it was just ugly, sloppy, bad decision making. And, and like I said, I, I think that they were maybe expecting something a little bit easier uh, coming out of the gate. And when they didn't get that, they they didn't look prepared for it. You you, you hope, and I do think that. They're ready for it now. They know that they're not going away. They're going to have the, the energy of their crowd behind them. The Avs have been a great road team now for two seasons, even going back to the last playoff, 9-1 and one on the road. Um, you wonder, is there maybe just a little bit less pressure, uh, you know, when you're, when you're not at home and you can kind of just focus on playing the game? It's going to be interesting because, you know, the Avs, they, they, they can't have another showing like they did in, in game one uh, or in that first period. They, they, they just can't. Being here on the road. If you're going to get behind like that, you know, you're going to be in trouble. Jesse, I'm going to preface this question with saying I understand some teams have played more playoff games so far than others. But you look at the top of the stat page right now, and you got Leon Dreisaitl with six points, Mitch Marner with six points, Adam Fox with six points, Anze Kopitar with five. Then you scroll all the way to the bottom. There are essentially 98 guys in this playoffs with more points than Miko Rantanen, Nathan McKinnon, and Kale McCarr, each of those guys stuck at one point. I guess how important is it for this Colorado Avalanche team to have one of those three guys step up, add a couple points to the score sheet, and work their way up the uh, the overall NHL statistics page here? So it's funny you said, AJ, or Jay, I was looking at that this morning, um, and I had the same thought. I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. The Avs don't have any guys like anywhere near that. Look, I think the Avs are in – a tighter playoff series than some of these other teams, right? I think they are, regardless of win or loss, I think these are going to be low-scoring games. Uh, you know, Seattle's playing a really tight defensive structure. They're not giving the Az a lot of time and space. Mm-hmm. They're in passing lanes. They're in shooting lanes. Um, so I don't necessarily know about working their way up the overall scoring list, but, like, you're 100% right. We talked about coming into this series, Seattle's got the depth. The Avs, by a mile, have the high-end talent. By 10 miles, have the high-end talent. You need that high-end talent to start showing through. You need Nathan McKinnon, Miko Rantanen, Kale McCarr, uh, you know, Val Nichushkin. You need those guys to start taking over the game. And that's where you're going to draw separation um, between yourselves and, and Seattle. And just for the record, just because he came down the slot and just fired a really nice shot, Lars Eller is out here flying around, looks totally fine. A um, little, little bit of a question mark after uh, mm-hmm. that yeah, hard click to the wall. Yep. Um, but y- you need that top-end talent to come through. You you need, by the time the Avs head back to Denver, you need Nathan McKinnon, Nico Rantanen, four, five points in this series each. You need Kale McCarr, three, four, five points. Like, you just need those top guys to start taking over because that's where the Avs are supposed to have the advantage in this matchup, right? You're supposed to have the high-end talent. You need that to start showing through a bit, and you need them to start producing. Again, I don't think that when the first round ends, the Avs will have any guys at the top of the, the point standings NHL-wise. Because I think this is going to be a tighter series than what you're seeing in, in other parts of the league. I mean, Toronto-Tampa, you two seven-goal blowouts, you know, back-to-back, each team trading blowouts. I just don't think you're necessarily going to get that in this series, um, but you need you need the top of your lineup to start producing. No question about it. You got to be careful when you say blowouts around JJ. It means entirely something different these days. I don't. <laughs> what, what do you think a blowout is, JJ? I, I don't. I don't get it. I don't follow Ryan's weird I mean, sense he must, of humor. He must not change diapers yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, yeah. I got Oop, it. Blowout. Also, I got you. Yeah, how yeah. dare you almost call him AJ? <laughs> I, I was hoping neither of you caught that, but I'm sure you both did. Uh, it's hey, it's I just, easy to mix. I, 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 I was such a big fan of he's AJ, I'm JJ. I just always thought it worked so well on the original uh, BSN pod. So I just, it's still stuck in my brain sometimes. Sometimes I call Ryan Arif. That's why he's just trying to point that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse, yeah, the difference between us is I was here on time. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, thanks, that is so true. Thanks for spending some time with us. Before we let you go, give us a, a quick prediction. What do you think the Avalanche do tonight? Is, is this one where they control momentum, they build off of what happened in game two, or does Seattle continue to give them fits? 
I'm going to say four to one. I think the Avs take this one. I think you're going to have to weather a storm early. You're going to need to lean on Alexander Georgiev, uh, and you're going to, your defensive details have to be on point tonight. They will have to be on point tonight from the opening puck drop. I think this crowd is going to be going nuts. I think the, the, the team is going to feed off it. And look, I think they are feeling confident. And why shouldn't they? They should be after the two games in Denver. Uh, you know, I think they are in a big, like, you know, we can hang with these guys. We can beat these guys mode. You're going to have to weather a storm. But I think the Avs will need to, I, I think they'll push back early after kind of getting through that. Uh, and I think they'll be able to take this one. Yeah, I think four to one. Right on. Get back to morning skate. Thanks again for hanging out with us. And we'll uh, talk to you soon. Appreciate it, boys. Talk to you soon. There you have it, Jesse Montano of DMVR. Always a pleasure. He's feeling good about the Avs. He's feeling high. I don't, I don't know if there's been enough for me to call a 4-1 to one victory out there yet, though. But it, it I... starts at the goaltending. That, like he just brought up, the goaltending is where the Avalanche have the upper hand, and they haven't been able to use that yet. I feel like he uh, may be overlooking the, the concern that was the first game in a third. You know, like he, he's happy to say that, they figured it out and they're good to go, but I don't know, you know, if if that is a if consistency is an issue, which it has been at points this season, I'm less confident. I love that. Thanks for joining the hockey show. You're wrong though, Jesse. Yeah. No, he made a lot of good points. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that'll do it. Uh, we'll be right back. We're going to break into uh, the rest of the league and all the other playoff series going around because there are seven other ones going on at Ryan. So stick through the break. This is the hockey show. JJ Jerez, Ryan Bolding, Danny Bailey, Mile High Sports. Mom- Let's go, Colorado. Welcome back. This is the Hockey Show. Danny's got snow on the mind. I'm sure a lot of people here in Colorado are, are spending the day up in the mountains. I'm sure they had to drive six and a half hours just to get there. But, hey, they might be there or they might be getting close to there. I am jealous. Hmm. I'm jealous of everybody on the beach in Miami right now because it's 85 degrees over there. Here we are in the snowy weather. Um, Ryan. That's me. Have you ever done karaoke? Uh, yeah. I like to do Red Hot Chili Peppers songs because I feel like I have the same key as the, the Chili Peppers. Song. And there's so much gibberish going on that if you mess up the words, no one knows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. Um, so I want to look at the rest of the league here. And, of course, we only have 12 minutes per segment. So we got to jam pack all seven other series into this segment. So I'm, I'm, I got my stopwatch out here. We're going to spend two minutes on each series. So that way we don't drive Danny Bailey cra- crazy and he doesn't give me this, the death stare of you guys need to get to break now. Just kidding. He doesn't do that. He's chill. He's a cool guy. Um, so let's get it going, Ryan. Actually, Danny, can you even hit us with maybe some background tunes on this one? Almost like a game show feel to it. You're just springing it on him. I know, in the moment. I know. Just throwing yeah. it on, but he's on his like, toes. That's what makes him the greatest the Jeopardy, producer. The Jeopardy Matt song. Where I, this is eating into our 12 minutes. It doesn't need to be Jeopardy. I just want some 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 tunes in the back. Um, so we'll wait with radio silence until he gets that. Go- oh, he's he's on top of it. There Here we, we go. go. Yeah. Ooh, I like this vibe too. Welcome into the hockey shows. Hockey look around on the NHL playoffs 2023. Ryan Bolding, the New York Rangers and New Jersey Devils. We talked about a little bit at the beginning of the show, but. Rangers up to nothing, heading back to MSG today. I know I said this was maybe the hardest series for me to pick. It definitely was in the East. I'd say also Minnesota and Dallas in the West. Hard series to pick, right? These two teams match up pretty well. A lot of hatred historically. You love to see it. I'm sure it's awesome to be a fan and a part of this. But I think that the Rangers have the edge in the talent, the veteran talent. JJ hasn't even started his timer yet on this first question. And I think... The goaltending in New York is far better. In fact, I think Vanacek is a good goalie, right? I'm saying it. I can't believe Washington got rid of him. He's had a great year for New Jersey. He's out. Akira Schmidt might be the starter tonight. Hit the streets. I, I don't know what to think about that, but I think I trust in Lindy Brown. I remember uh, early on in the season I came on this show and I said, man, the Devils have a great backup goaltender. I don't know his first name, but his last name Schmidt. Akira Schmidt is, is a quality goaltender as well. Does he match up to Shesterkin? Absolutely not. You have goalie controversy in the playoffs. You're a disaster. Rangers are taking it tonight. Here's a side note. I talked to Keith Kincaid yesterday. He backed up as the third goalie for the Rangers when they went to the Eastern Conference Final last year. I asked him, you know, can you? did you see this out of Georgiev at the time? He said he did. Obviously, I said nobody is going to steal the throne from Shesterkin there, which is no surprise why Georgiev's with the Avalanche. Next, 
Start the timer. That was fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to do better on this one. All right, let's get to Carolina versus New York, another series we dabbled into a little bit, but not really too much. Low-scoring series uh, on paper, right? And just a defensive matchup that kind of rocks you to sleep, to be honest. Yeah, this is a series where you were worried when, uh, who was it that got hurt? Uh, Sveshnikov, Sveshnikov got hurt for Carolina. And you're like, oh, no, that's a big component of their offense. Hasn't necessarily been an issue. Yesterday, I said out loud, I don't know that the Islanders can steal a game in this series. And then they did that at home. I mean, when you got a guy like Matt Martin sniping shots, things are going your way. Finish 5-1, to one, like you mentioned. I think, uh, you know, some interesting moments. Marty Nikash, I can't ever say his name right, gets hit into Nietzsche. the bench. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Gets hit into the bench. My favorite part of that whole scenario was Simeon Varlamov standing there like, should I help him up? I'm I'm not going to. I don't know what to do. And then he punched somebody in the face on the Islanders bench. And then Varley shoves him off the boards as he's jumping. It's kind of like a I don't know what to do with my hands here moment. All right. Let's get to Boston versus Florida. I love the energy you're bringing, though, here. I'm Break, trying. Keep it up. I'm I trying. love it. Let's go. Boston versus Florida. Uh, Boston versus Florida. You. That's it? You got nothing for me? Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> Linus Olmark is a game-time decision for game four, he's apparently battling something other than the stomach flu that's going around. I'm waiting for the stomach flu to crop up with the Florida Panthers. It seems mm-hmm. unlikely that they would not contract what's going around the Boston room at some point in this series. I was very impress- impressed with Florida's win in game two. I thought that this team might get folded over itself multiple times in this series, but Boston came out and slapped them around in the next game. I just don't know that Florida has enough to keep up with it. I've really loved what I've seen out of Alex Lyon in this series. He has had some gaffes. He had a goal last night, go off of his glove again into the net. You saw Bobrovsky in at the end of the game. I still don't know that you give Bobrovsky any starts here. Yeah, not enough firepower from the Florida Panthers there. There's my snippet for you. Let's get to Toronto versus Tampa Bay. Of course, everybody in the Toronto area was shocked and in tears after game one and saying, oh, no, here we go again. It feels like Toronto has righted the ship a little bit. The, the, the game two... Where are we at? We only played two games? Yeah. yeah. Game two, they came out and obliterated Tampa. I mean, Tampa was having issues with fans. Guys were getting kicked out of the penalty box because fans were giving them too much of a hard time. <laughs> like, that's what you expected out of Toronto in game one. But you knew that they were going to lose game one. It's easy to say in hindsight, but with all of the pressure and the expectations and the, you haven't made it out of the first round in, you know, like my entire lifetime, you knew that was going to happen, right? And we've seen it time and time again. We talked about not counting out the Tampa Bay Lightning. I still can't. I still can't do it. I picked Toronto to win today, but I don't feel good about it. Fair enough. I think that's a spot on analysis. Let's get to Minnesota versus Dallas. I think this has been the most physical series. Maybe the biggest question mark of nobody knows who's going to win this game. And even more so the series. Well, or yeah, yeah, win the series, but even more so. This is who the Avalanche will face. The winner of this series will play the Avalanche if they get out of this round, and that's going to be a physical series as well. So I know everybody's happy that the Avalanche aren't playing either of these teams currently, especially after mm-hmm. five periods, four periods of hockey that we've seen from the Avalanche so far. We've had two good periods. Uh, but, you know, I don't know that them beating each other to death is really going to hurt these two teams coming out of this. Like, the winner of this series is going to come out of here juiced up. They're going to come out of here bruised up, but vulcanized like a hockey puck. Yep. Like it's it's just going to be bodies are just going to be scabs. It's going to be like extra armor. These guys are <laughs> going to tear it up. I didn't think Dean Evison's idea of going to Mark Andre Fleury was the right move. Gustafson played so well in that game. I didn't think he deserved to be taken out. And he's back and he won. I well, mean, I think there's some solace from Minnesota that now that decision has been made. The experiment has already yeah. been done. You can right. head the rest of the playoffs with Gustafson. Gustafson has been solid. You want to see a little more out of Jake Ottinger. This is the issue I've had with Dallas for a while, and that is they're two different teams. They're a team that scores goals and a team that does not. And when they don't score goals, they don't win. So you're, you're looking to say, Dallas, where is all the firepower you had? You got to get Robertson going more, right? You're getting a hat trick out of Rupe Hintz. The guy can't carry the team on his own. Breaking news. You got to score goals to win hockey games, folks. That brings us to the Vegas Golden Knights versus the Winnipeg Jets. This was a, an interesting series because I, I thought it was because of all the Canadian pundits, but so many people coming in this series picking 
the Winnipeg Jets. And here we are, the Winnipeg Jets putting up pretty pretty decent fight. Like I said today, my betting app had Winnipeg. I think at plus one or at, at minus one hundred to win tonight's game, which is sh- a bit shocking to me. I did not expect the Jets to win a game in this series. I think I picked it in six just to be generous in my bracket. But the way that Winnipeg sort of backed into the the playoffs, you know, they won some big games, but they lost some big games. I did not expect this from them. Nikolai Ehlers not playing in the game today. That's a big loss for this team. On the other hand. Mark Stone returns from the grave. The man literally had two back surgeries in less than two years. You're wondering, is he ever going to play again? Just shows up ready to go in the playoffs. I know fans are mad because they think it's some LTIR shtick going on. I don't believe it. I just think the guy is an animal. Look at the way he celebrated that goal. He's an elite talent. There's no shtick. He's their captain, right? And he played like 23 minutes in the first game back. Like, it's, I don't know what to think. It's unbelievable. It's Mark Stone, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. That, that's a series that you got to keep your eye on for sure. And then they, let's and get somehow them. they got the two o'clock slot today. It makes yeah. no sense to me. Oh, don't even get me started. Um, the finally, last series, finally, my favorite series. The reason why, because I get to be the Kermit the Frog in the meme drinking my tea while the rest of you picked Edmonton to go to the Western Conference Final. Edmonton versus L.A. Are the L.A. Kings the sleeper of t- this year's playoffs? I'm starting to feel like they were, and I only say that because a lot of people picked Edmonton to go to the final. I didn't want to do it, but I did it because I didn't think that the Avalanche could physically withstand the prolonged physicality of the postseason. I stand by that, but... Edmonton is giving me a little bit of a scare. I still think they're going to pull it out in the long run, but the Kings are so good defensively. Like, if you can keep Connor McDavid off the score sheet, which isn't easy to do, and they haven't done a lot, but, I mean, this is a game-breaker guy, right? Connor McDavid should have the ability to win these games for Edmonton. It isn't happening. And I, the hatred is amping up. You saw uh, some animosity between Evander Kane and Drew Doughty last night. There's controversy. Did Cave Velarde touch that puck with a high stick? The more that I watch the trajectory, the physics of the flipping puck in as tight of a replay as I can find it, I think it was a high stick. But I don't know. You know, this series has all of the elements. It's got some hatred. It's got physicality. It's got controversy. It's fun to watch. It's a pity that it's always the latest of late games. But, yeah, this is the one. L.A. has one thing to do to win this series, and that's stay out of the box. Edmonton scored four power play goals already in the three games this year. And that's pretty much all Connor McDavid has been able to c- contribute is power play I mean, points. L.A. LA scored 10, 15 seconds into a power play last night, too. I mean, yeah, you don't want to. One thing you really don't want to do is take any four on four opportunities. When this team has Dry Seidel and McDavid out there together four on four, there's too much ice. These guys are magic. They're wizards. There you have it. They're <laughs> wizards, Harry. Take a deep breath now. We did it. We made it. <laughs> Crushed it. Way to go. Love the energy. We did everything on time, and we got through every single series. There's not one stone we left unturned here on the hockey show as we head into break. So, um, yeah, it's a fun show. Fun show we're having today. Playoff There's energy. Still we're bringing it. Oh, we, time left we forgot in the, the hockey show. We forgot to put the Stanley oh, Cup man. in between us like we normally do for Dang laps. It. But we'll be back for the Stupid. mixed bag skate. Uh, get over a couple uh, more topics. Little. I'm a dumbass. Uh. <laughs> It hurts. Uh, I, all right. This is the hockey show. JJ Jerez, Ryan Bolding, Danny Bailey. We'll be right back. I play hockey and I fornicate because it's the two most fun things in cold weather. Ooh, boy, do we have cold weather here today. Hopefully you're doing one of those two things. Just keep yourself warm and entertained, I guess. Because you're not golfing. You might be stuck in traffic driving to the mountains. So can't play hockey doing that. You got you to Make up your mind here, but welcome to the Mixed Bag Skate. This is the hockey show. This is the last section of the show where if I was a listener, I'd probably tune out at this point. I, after all the energy I brought <laughs> in the last segment. That's true. You're like, they, they got to finish strong, right? They're like, I'm going to keep right? watching just to see if he passes out and dies. <laughs> His heart just explodes. I think the conversation and the happening in the NHL playoffs that caught the eye of everyone, not just hockey fans, but sports fans all around was Morgan Barron of the Winnipeg Jets catching a skate to the face and receiving 75 stitches. But wait, it doesn't stop there. The crazy MF returned to the game, just slapped a cage on and said, I'm finishing this playoff game. I don't care how many stitches I got in my face. Amazing stuff. I mean, just thoughts, feelings. It it feels like every year this is the time where that tired meme comes out of insert X 
hockey player injury and insert LeBron James holding his leg down on the ground. And it's like hockey players, they literally died and then came back and finished their shift. And basketball players just looked at it and were like, load management, I need a night off. <laughs> and it was funny 10 years ago. 10 years ago. It's not funny anymore. It's tired. But impressive. Morgan Barron, I mean, it wasn't like a skate like slice. Like, I'm cutting fruit here. It wasn't one of those. It wasn't like the cut that cut Gabriel Landeskog's leg. You know, he fell face first onto a skate. It's like, it's like I don't know, a horror movie, right? Where somebody's, like, knife is coming at somebody's eye or something. He had to watch his face come down on the goalie skate. And it just cut his face. I remember being at the game where Taylor Hall got hit behind the avalanche net and cut Ryan O'Byrne's cheek. And his cheek was like flapping and it was a PK and he stayed out for the entire PK. And I was club level behind the net and you could see him bleeding all over the ice. That's how much he was bleeding. You could see it the entire time he was out there. I think he ended up with like 90 stitches. It's crazy. I know this is going to rattle hockey purists out there and I'm one of them. But you know what could have completely prevented that whole scenario? Rollerblades. The freaking cage that he put on after the injury. Jeez. Maybe if you put it on before the injury, boo, you don't have to get 75 stitches. But, hey, that's just my opinion. I know pro players are never going to get on board with cages. You, you never know completely, but the NHL has mandated visors, and there are, I believe, four players who are grandfathered into that who don't have to wear them. Jamie Benn is one. Ryan O'Reilly is another. I have no idea on the other two. But that is crazier to me I think than, Ryan wearing, is one of them. than wearing a visor, like having nothing there to protect your face. At some point, why? There, there is zero justification like, oh, it's going to change my game or how I see the game. It's not. You know what will change the, the way you see a game? A skate to the eyeball. Yeah, no eyes will change how you see hockey. Also, players are just so set in their ways with their gear. Like you look around the Avalanche locker room, there is the gnarliest, grossest, shaggiest stuff hanging from people's stalls. Did I had no the- idea until this year I started paying attention. Of course, the, the pros go through gloves and sticks and helmets, but the under gear, they, you could tell some of those guys have had it for years. That Some of them have companies that don't even exist in the hockey world anymore. You see, I think Eric Johnson's shoulder pads are Reebok. Reebok doesn't make hockey equipment anymore. My favorite is Connor, it for Connor years. McDavid's socks. There's a picture that I think the NHL posted of Connor McDavid's socks. They're cut-proof socks. They have holes in them. His big toes, like, sticking out of them. He just keeps wearing them. Why? I'm sure he'd be just as good of a player in fresh socks. And those are the first guys to be like, I'm not superstitious. And you're like, yeah? Well, then why are you using your socks from uh, Cooper 1983? <laughs> Cooper was my first hockey stick brand. You, you, you cut deep with that one. Will Farrell attends yesterday's L.A. Kings game. Of course, it was in L.A. Now, no longer the Staples Center, the Crypto.com Center or stadium, something like that. But Will Farrell had a, his face painted, right? I don't know if that was an attempt to disguise himself a little bit or just truly, genuinely showing how big of an L.A. Kings fan he is because he, he is. I have so many thoughts about this. The first is I love that he just is passionate. You know, I feel like there's a propensity for celebrities at events to be like, I'm a celebrity and I'm here, and I'm buttoned up, and I'm tight, and I got to look good and smile for the camera and do the queen wave. But I need to blow my nose, apparently. Yeah, I need to blow my nose. <laughs> uh, and then there's Will Ferrell, who has no problem making an ass out of himself. And he face-painted himself. He looked like a checkered flag from a NASCAR race, but also nightmare fuel. Like, the black, he had, like, white and, and black checkers on his face, but his eyes were blacked out. It's like straight nightmare fuel. Well done. Hilarious. I mean, the man is, is probably willing this team into winning right now. It's a good thing he added the white paint in there, too, right? How, how bad would that have been had he not? If it was just, like, skin and black boxes? Oh, no. Just, just straight black paint. Oh, yeah. That would have been uh, probably not good. The, uh, Only Robert Downey Jr. can do that. One cover. <laughs> The one conversation that uh, huh? I wanted to have today, what? you, you kind of hinted at it in the last segment there, and that's the game time. The puck drop starts. They're absolutely absurd, especially in game one where we're sitting here in Colorado for an 8 o'clock puck drop. Meanwhile, Las Vegas has a 7.30 puck drop, our time, which is 6.30 Las Vegas time. So everybody in the entire playoffs gets to have a decent puck time, puck drop time at one point or another, except for your Colorado Avalanche. Well, you know, poop rolls downhill 
and the time zones run east to west. So I don't have a problem with the Eastern teams getting earlier start times. But it's weird on a Saturday for Vegas to start at 2 and the the Avalanche and Kraken to start again at 8. Like, why does that need to be a 7 p.m. start time in Seattle? Why can't it be at 3 o'clock? Like, what's give us some early games. Yeah, you know? Nuggets started at 8, 8 o'clock as well. Like we're, we're not on the West Coast. We're closer to the Central time zone than anything. They should just play games in the morning. Oh great um lastly brian it's saturday night playoff hockey eight o'clock start for your colorado avalanche what's your setup how are you watching tonight's game what 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 do you do to bring these saturday vibes to your playoff hockey (laughs) right now i think i'm gonna go home and nap (laughs) for two three hours then i'm probably gonna well i can't nap for two three hours because there's a game on in an hour so yard work is out of the question Mm -hmm. luckily i don't have to shovel uh, I guess that means video games. Not original at all. That's all you ever do. What What are you going to do? Uh, I, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's what I thought. All right. Well, I'm going to go. It. I'll crack open one of my last two smelling salts and be ready to go. Here we were. Just plug hockey straight into my veins. I've been I've been mainlining this since the playoffs started. I'm tired. I am tired. I've it's had hard. iPads, computer screens, TVs. You've going. got the late games going into overtimes. You've got You're the like, nuggets I, to keep an eye on. I don't need this. Night one, double overtime between Minnesota and Dallas. Why? Why did you do this to me? Here I was coming into this show thinking it's playoffs. We're going to have a, a, a really great show. We're going to raise our game to playoff level, and then we had this. And then this well, is what we did. I had a very good third. Wait, was that sarcasm? <laughs> yeah. PP2 was great for me. I'm sorry you had to watch it from the bench. I'm just kidding. I had fun. This was a fun show today. Playoff vibes, playoff energy. So uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. We'll be back next week to break down more playoffs and hopefully bring in that same energy and same vibe. So um, thanks for hanging out. This is The Hockey Show. For Ryan, I'm JJ. See you later. We out.